just five minutes past the hour. So let's get started. And I'm really excited to have here today Laurent White and Dimitar Trenev from ExxonMobil. Having them here talking to us makes this um, a very special circuit session because we will learn from them uh, good insights about how industry is using quantum circuits and their interest in, in quantum computing. So Laurent has a PhD in engineering mathematics. He's the section head for computational physics in the corporate uh, strategic research lab at Exxon, where he is leading a group of very talented scientists, mathematicians, and engineers who are using um, high performance computing and novel computing technologies to solve problems that affect different sectors of the energy industry. And I learned also that he is an Ironman competitor. And so he is joined also by Dimitar. Dimitar has a PhD in mathematics. He's a scientist at Exxon Corporate um, Strategic Research Lab. He's researching novel computing technologies. He's working to develop algorithms to explore a number of problems with a focus on quantum computing and machine learning. And so besides music and travel and history, Dimitar, just like me, enjoys cooking and baking. And I've been doing a lot of that myself lately. So Laurent, Dimitar, thank you so much for being here, for talking to us and sharing with us your perspectives on quantum circuits, letting us know a little bit about your research. We're thrilled to have you join us. And so to start, can you tell us more about you, um, about what you're working on and your journey to quantum computing? Sure. Should I, so who starts? <laughs> Should you I go. Start? Okay. Um, well, so thank you, Zara. And uh, first, I really want to thank IBM here for, for hosting us. Uh, this is a privilege to be here. Uh, and I think I can speak on behalf of, of Dimitar as well. Um, so yeah, it's such a treat to be here, to be able to speak to you. Um, as Zara said, I have, um, I have a PhD in applied mathematics. Um, so I joined ExxonMobil about 11 years ago. Before that, I worked on uh, ocean modeling, numerical ocean modeling. So my background is really about solving large scale computational problems. Um, now, be before, before we get into more details about you know, quantum computing, I, I just want to spend a few minutes explaining how ExxonMobil and why ExxonMobil decided to get into uh, quantum computing. Um, so one thing, you know, the, the oil and gas industry and ExxonMobil in particular has been uh, involved in large scale computations for decades, um, seven, at least 70 years, starting with actually analog computing for reservoir simulation. And we've been writing Moore's law, you know, all the way through the last few years um, in all sectors of the oil and gas industry. And that includes, you know, big exploration problems, you know, seismic wave propagation, uh, computational chemistry problem, optimization problems, biology problems, all these problems require heavy use of computations. Um, as you may know, the, the oil and gas industry is going to, you know, going through a transition, an energy transition, driven by the dual challenge of, you know, providing energy to a growing population in the world that's striving to access the middle class quality of life and the, the urgent need to mitigate CO2 emissions. Um, we can only go through this transition by, by using even more computation to find new materials for carbon capture, um, driving efficiency even higher through optimization, for example. Um, so while we're going through this transition in the energy industry, the computing industry is also going through a transition um, driven by the, the slowdown of Moore's law. Um, and that's really what triggered our, our interest in, in emerging computing. Um, and so what we did a few years ago, two years ago, we, we started a future of computing study to understand how emerging computing hardware would affect the computations we do. And part of the study was um, identification of new hardware that could impact our business. And quantum computing was one key uh, emerging hardware, we decided to have a, a really, really uh, look into that. Um, so, interestingly, nobody at ExxonMobil knew anything about quantum computing. And um, I'm going to slowly get into, you know, the, the personal journey of Dimitar, who's, you know, a, a very brilliant applied mathematician and decided about a year and a half ago, to, you know, he told me in my office, you know what, 
I'm going to get into this and I'm going to understand quantum computing and what it takes to write algorithms and build circuits. Um, and, you know, he started to, I mean, I don't want to steal his thunder here, but he started to play with the, the Q experience or the IBM, the 5 qubit Q experience. And it just blew people's mind at Exxon because, you know, somebody was actually getting to that. Um, but, you know, we, we've been in, in partnership with IBM for about a year, um, working in two key areas that are important for us, which is uh, quantum chemistry and optimization. And I think the work that we're going to show you today is specifically about quantum chemistry. Um, but before we get there, uh, I want to give some time to Demetar to explain his you know, personal journey as, a, as an applied mathematician to a, you know, our expert in quantum computing. Yeah, thank you. So as Lauren says, I, I am a mathematician. Uh, I, have a, I have a PhD in mathematics. But my interest has uh, um, has always been in computation. I, I always have referred to myself as a computational scientist. Uh, you know, even back in when I was choosing a uh, a major in in college back in Bulgaria, I had to choose between you know computer science and and mathematics. And back in the days, you know, all the, all the professors were coming from this, um, at least in Bulgaria, you know, communist. Um, um, high academic uh, vision that, uh, you know, computer science is great, but it's, it's, it's a craft. You learn it by doing. Real science is physics, you know, mathematics. So I, I, I don't subscribe to that view, but that, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's why I got my degree in mathematics. But my, my interest has always been in, in computation. So, so uh, when I joined Exxon in the computational physics section, I was working on numerical solutions of PDEs and use of high performance computing to solve uh, real life industry problems. And um, to, to repeat, Laurent, we have plenty of, of, of real life industry problems and, and we can use any type of computing platform to, um, to, to try and advance them. And um, when I kind of started hearing about quantum computing, mainly from, from, from the popular science media, uh, I got really interested because uh, it's, it's, it's close to my, my uh, scientific interest as a mathematician. It is an uh, extremely um, interesting area and it sounds very futuristic. You know, it's like uh, it's, it's perfect for a guy like me to, to try and... Uh, get deep into. And yeah, during the future of computing study that Laurent talked about, uh, I, I felt I, I was getting like a second PhD or at least a master's in, in quantum computing by just, you know, searching materials and, and reading and experimenting with the IBM Q experience, which, which was great. Hey, thank you, guys. And, and of course, you know, we are using quantum computers. Your quantum computer will only be useful to you if it can execute those computational tasks that we that, that we need and that you need. Right. And, and if it gives you a computational advantage in solving those problems that you care about and to achieve that, we use quantum circuits. So how powerful those computers are, that's determined by how like what complex circuits they can run. So I would like to ask you, can you share with us what the circuits mean to you as a researcher and developer? Um, so, so I can start on that. There are two parts on this question, uh, as a researcher and as a developer, right? So um, uh, as a researcher, how, how I think of quantum circuits is, is just this um, uh, big, operators on, on, on an incredibly high dimensional um, uh, Hilbert space. I, uh, you, 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 you have a, a quantum state, you pass it through a quantum circuit, it, it produces a, another quantum state. And, and as I said, I think about, I think about circuits as just big matrices essentially, but that, that comes from, from my background, my background in mathematics. Um, when, when I talk to, you know, people with background in, in quantum physics, uh, they would sometimes refer to quantum circuits as, uh, Hamiltonians, you know, you, you have a quantum state that you evolve, uh, and, and, and get, um, the different quantum state at the end. 
uh, I think of quantum state as, as, as big um, vectors and because that's easy for me. Uh, and that's that's how I can uh, wrap my head around around quantum circuits. And th this brings me to a point. You know, you don't have to you don't have to have a degree in quantum physics in order in order to start looking into quantum computing. You know, uh, um, linear algebra suffices for for most purposes in the beginning. Um, as a developer. Uh, I, I think of quantum circuits a little bit differently. I, I think of them as, as programs or instructions to the, to the quantum computer. So, so I am thinking of how to construct this, this operator that I had in mind using the um, universal set of, of gates that, that I'm provided on, on the hardware. So using um, you know, one qubit and, and, and two, two qubit gates. Um, and yes, we, we, we talk about quantum computers. I, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think of it more as a quantum processor. Uh, I just have a quantum register. I, I have some instructions to that proce processor and I get another state that I can, um, infer something about in the register. This is, this is my view of a, of a developer coming from, you know, playing with the, um, uh, um, x86 or 386, 486 uh, um, computers in from the 90s when you would have a coprocessor next to the main processor that would do a faster or better uh, arithmetic uh, yeah. instructions. And we are hoping that the quantum computer with its ability to operate on this huge um, uh, spacing information space uh, can provide adv an advantage. So, can I can I add a few things here? Of course. Um, of course. Right. So, um, when when you know when Dimitar started to work on circuits and really understanding circuits, it, it really clearly appeared um, quickly that it was you know the basis was linear algebra. And since Dimitar and I speak the same language, that was actually very reassuring uh, that he was able to explain everything in terms of matrices and vectors. Uh, that really helped understand uh, the, 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 whole, the whole thing. So uh, on top of that, I want to add uh, another dimension about circuits. And um, I'm speaking directly to the, uh, our industrial um, viewers here, or spectators of, of this, uh, this episode. Um, you know, as a, as a section head and, and a team lead of the, of the project, I, you know, I had to explain to a lot of people why we, you know, wh why take so much time and effort to understand quantum computing. And, you know, getting into circuits is, is the same way we were in the, you know, 1950s or 60s in terms of transistors and, and writing code for these, these transistors, right? We're back to that. We really need to, need to understand the gates and every operation. And for a lot of people who, you know, are not close to the, the discipline here, it's actually hard to understand. And so it, it was also a journey within the company to explain why we were talking about gates and circuits, like people were talking about circuits and gates like in the 50s, right? Um, it takes time, it takes, it takes significant effort, you know, to convince people that we need to do research because we think it's gonna pay out in the future, uh, big time if everything pans out. Um, for certain applications, that's the, the other thing I wanna say, and I know I'm, this is not really directly to circuits here, but you know, um, a lot of people, again, um, may think that, oh, quantum computing is the next, <clears throat> the next uh, <clears throat> HPC system. Uh, well, quantum computing will only be good for certain niche applications. Uh, and we, we had to repeat that a few times to make sure it's understood. Uh, and so, so, okay, so now back to, maybe back to circuits and, you know, more depth in, in technical field, but. Thank you. Yeah, and so. Um, I see that um, people here um, in the channel want to know about the quantum chemistry problems that you know, are relevant for the oil and gas industry. So this is a good opportunity then to talk about um, those problems and then what type of search uh, you have been used to tap those problems in your research and can you illustrate how you, how you, how you use them, how you adapt them to fit your needs. 
Um, um, Laura, do you want to start? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we, we, you know, ExxonMobil is an integrated company, which means we have a chemical sector, uh, which heavily relies on, on developing new materials. And just want to want to say a few words here. You know, isopropyl alcohol was developed in 1920 by Standard Oil, which is the ancestor of ExxonMobil. Uh, so we have a long history of developing and inventing new chemical products. Uh, the Mobile One lub lubricant, for example, is a, is a chemical product which was well invented by Mobile. So again, decades of history in finding new materials um, that that have specific properties for specific applications. You know, whether you think of lubes or catalysts to speed up chemical reactions in reactors, for example. So. Um, you know, the next phase of research uh, might be about finding new materials based on polymers, uh, could be composite materials, for example, or new materials to do carbon capture. Uh, and that I'm, you know, I'm getting back to the dual challenge here. It's providing energy while reducing CO2 emissions. So we're gonna be, we're gonna have to be in that business of, of pro, you know, doing both at the same time. And I think material discovery will be key. Um, now, in order to develop new materials with specific properties that you have in mind, you need to understand the fundamentals of the quantum chemistry. You need to understand the electronic energy. You need to understand specific properties of the material, like the optical properties, thermal properties. And you go, in order to do that, you have to really understand, you know, the molecules at the quantum chemistry level. And this is where quantum computing can really help. Um, and we're not necessarily talking about you know, um, getting more uh, or faster results. We're getting, we're talking about more accuracy. Um, you know, for a lot of molecules, uh, you know, CO2, benzene, all the polymers, we, we can get some approximate results uh, about all these properties using DFT, so density functional theory, for example. Um, we also think that for certain molecules, as soon as they get bigger and bigger, the accuracy really gets bad. Um, to a point where predictability degrades. Um, and this is where I think quantum chemistry on quantum computer can help um, if we develop the right algorithms and the right circuits and the right, the right um, noise mitigation. Um, so back to you, Zyra, <laughs> for, for these circuits. <laughs> that is so definitely a, uh, something we're working on. I know, and I know, and we're happy yeah. to, uh, to, to know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Dimitra, can you um, tell us a little bit about you know, how you use circuits in, in your research? And I see questions that people are interested in saying if you're using VQE for any practical purposes, like if you're seeing any better accuracy. So, let's so talk about how is, you use the circuits. Excellent question. This is exactly what we're, uh, we're, I'm going to show in, 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 in this notebook um, uh, shortly. But yes, we, we are using VQE now because uh, VQE is uh, one of the few applications of the, the noisy hardware that um, uh, that we have and the one has reasons to be cautiously optimistic uh, about the future of VQE in, in chemistry. We have two tracks uh, we're, we're, we're not only looking at quantum chemistry we're looking also at um, optimization, for example, coming back to the fact that we as a company have problems in, in many different different areas. Um, and it's a different question there, uh, you know, how can I apply VQE and whether I can uh, hope to get to a quantum advantage at the scale that uh, the optimization program would require, which would be in, you know, the thousands of qubits we, we estimate. Just because you know people have been solving optimization problems for a while, and uh, they have very good heuristics on on how to solve an optimization problem, you know, with with few um, unknowns, which few being for them, you know, a couple of thousand. Um, uh, chemistry, on the other hand, you just you just need a, a quantum computer to 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 represent the wave function. The wave function is just so big that uh, classically you, 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 you cannot re represent it when you start talking about more than, uh, than a few, you know, uh, atoms. 
and um, and yes, we are using VQE because um, um, this basically a hybrid uh, quantum. We we cannot use say phase estimation yet to try or or uh, to try to um, solve for the ground state energy or any other you know uh, eigen solve uh, algorithm that would require a much deeper uh, circuit. So we are we, we are using VQE, and I can go to the um, um, notebook if you if you guys want me to. Please, yes. All right. So let me see. Share screen. Uh, okay. Whoops. Do you see a notebook? We see the notebook. Excellent. So um, it's 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 a demo of an application that we have, um, and I'll I'll talk about what it is. But um, I just want to see say I've I've set here Exxon Mobil and IBM. There there's a lot of people that contributed to to the research that uh, we're doing. You know, um, um, I should mention some names. Uh, Donny Greenberg from from IBM. Uh, he actually. Um, wrote the first version of this notebook ba based on a, a example Python script that I had. Um, Stuart Harward, um, when we talk about the, optimiz the optimizer that we use, which is a very core um, key here to getting the results that we need uh, from ExxonMobil, he um, provided basically a lot of optimization knowledge to, to construct it. Spencer Stober uh, from ExxonMobil as well. He's our chemist on the team and he is responsible for getting, you know, from these uh, energies that we're calculating on the quantum computer to the pro thermodynamic properties that we need in order to um, answer the, the real life questions we're, we're interested in. So this notebook goes through um, essentially this whole process of using the quantum computer to calculate a, um, a potential energy surface, then get energy states for, for, for a given molecule uh, all the way to the thermodynamical properties uh, of that particular material. Or in this case, it will be a gas, uh, hydrogen, because you know, um, this is a very small example that we can uh, run now on the on the quantum hardware. So, as you can see, the first thing that that we do is just we, we have some uh, usual Qiskit components. Um, the circuits that we are going to use in the VQE, as as people know, uh, they are basically the ansatz. And although we would we have looked and we would like to use uh, some more chemistry informed transits uh, like uh, UCCSD or um, or something else relevant to our problem like we are attempting to do uh, in optimization. Here for the purposes of this demo uh, are just the regular RY um, circuits that suffice to represent the wave function of the hydrogen. So we import what we need. The next thing is we're describing, we have a molecule class that describes the molecule that, that we want to work with. Uh, in this very simple example, that would be a hydrogen um, molecule with two hydrogen atoms at a, at a distance of 0.45 angstroms apart. Um, and then we would be uh, using the VQE with an RY ansatz and the Hartree-Fock initial state to sample the um, potential energy surface of this molecule. In, in our code, this is just one line because uh, we've modified some of these classes, you know, the Hartree-Fock, the VQE to, to uh, work with this molecule describing class. But for the purposes of this demo, this this all uses Qiskit as is or as was uh, in the April release. Um, 
so when we run this, and I'm going to run this because uh, this this will take a little bit. Uh, it runs on the state vector simulator. So what we do here is is essentially the core of getting accurate results from the quantum computer. Um, we sample the the whole potential energy surface at, at different distances between between the molecules here from you can see from 40 0.45 to 5 angstroms uh, and calculate the ground state energy at each uh, each distance and here here is here is what we get uh, points uh, and an energy the optimizer here is key and i will show that in a little bit when i start changing optimizers uh, and then then we'll discuss where where research goes in into getting the best results from the quantum computer but seeing how to follow this we can now plot the results that we have and we we, we get these uh, points and and calculated energies uh for, for for those points from there on what we can do is we want the whole energy surface not just the discrete points so we need some way of interpolating between those points. In, in, in this example, I'm using a simple spline interpolant because these points already are accurate enough to represent the energy surface. And once I have the whole energy surface, I can compute the uh, vibrational modes of, of the molecule and, and different energy levels, which we would need in order to propagate that for a full thermodynamical property of the system. Um, in this case, I'm using, again, a um, numerical uh, solver for, for the Schrodinger equation there. It's a 1D equation. Uh, I'm fitting the energy servers to the data, and then I will plot it along with its um, energy level. So, so here is the whole energy surface is perfectly fitting to the, to the points because I've used splines. Uh, and, and, and these are the energy levels that we can calculate from having that, that surface. And now where we have the, the different molecular energy levels, we can move this all the way forward to calculating thermodynamical properties of, of a system of, you know, in, in this case, a gas of, um, of hydrogen molecules. That, that is done through... Uh, the partition function, where which which moves from you know these microscopic energy levels to the macroscopic energy uh, of of the system. Um, all of the partition function needs are information for the energy surface and from this vibronic structure of the molecule, and I can pass this to a thermodynamics uh, code that we have that computes, for example, the constant pressure heat capacity. And this is the computed constant pressure heat capacity for the hydrogen at different uh, temperatures. The green crosses that I hope you guys can see uh, here are uh, experimental results. So, so you can see a perfect fit, as you would expect for, for a small molecule like that. Uh, to give a more detailed example the, for the partition function, we can we can look at different components of the partition function. Uh, in the particular case of hydrogen, you, you know hydrogen can be a ortho hydrogen or para hydrogen, depending on how the spins in the nucleus are oriented. Uh, and we might want to look at the um, particular thermodynamic properties of the uh, ortho or para hydrogen, uh, and and that's what this uh, bit of code here allows us. We can we can get deeper into the partition function to get different thermodynamic properties. So, Dimitri, can you um, tell us how many qubits you're using in this calculation, and how the different trial functions affect the accuracy of the molecule, the you know, the calculation? Yes, so again, this is a hydrogen uh, molecule and we are using the STO3G basis set. So 
we are only using two qubits for uh, for this particular test. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the different trial functions uh, in uh, that that affect the accuracy. It's more the optimizer. And this is, if you allow me, to just run it a little bit um, differently, and I will show you why the optimizer is so key. So uh, you might just be tempted to just use SPSA as is uh, without playing, uh, you know, with uh, with different parameters for for the SPSA algorithm, and that's that's what I'm gonna do now. This is actually um, I'm, I'm I'm not gonna do the calculations on the computer now. They are cal calculations with noise, so so these are actually from actual. Uh, experiments with the noise on uh, IBM Q Melbourne uh, with just out of the box SPSA first. So I will restart and run all. And that should be uh, fast because I don't do any calculations. I, I, I'm just going to take them from from the file. So, so what you can see is just just doing SPSA. You're reading SPSA. Is this this is this is the the um, discrete energies that we're calculating at the different points. Uh, this is the uh, calculated potential energy surface afterwards, fitting the splites to these um, uh, calculated energies. This is the constant pressure heat capacity. As you can see, it qualitatively has the uh, information that we're looking for, but it, the values are quantitatively way off from the um, experimental values that we have for, for hydrogen. And same goes for, you know, the normal um, one to three part or the distribution uh, of, of hydrogen atom for which we have experimental data. And, and this shows, you know, the, if, if you want to get the good results for the quantum computer, you have to be careful of, again, what, what circuits you use, definitely, and what, what your answer is, it is very important for the hydrogen case. As I said, most of the ansatz can represent the wave function. So, so the key is in the optimizer. And in this case, we use this, um, uh, optimizer called Grabber, which uh, we developed. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned Stuart Harwood, and I, I should mention him again. He was key in in, in bringing this to uh, fruition. Uh, Grabber stands for gradient-based um, gradient descent with bootstrapping and epochs and adaptive resamplings. And these are three techniques for um, getting ensuring the better convergence of the optimizer. Bootstrapping, meaning that since we are, we are um, computing energy levels, not, not for a single well-defined molecule, but a molecule with, uh, we, we, we want it at um, the whole energy surface, we can, we can provide a better initial guess to the VQE. Uh, epochs means that we control in, in a smart, way the um, step lengths for the gradient descent. So in the resampling mm -hmm. is, is the number of samples that you need to take in order to assure that uh, you have, based on the covariances that you read, uh, a good enough um, um, result. And as you can see, the, I, I, I run it with, with the with out of the box X, SPSA, you can see that the, the, the the results would be way off. Uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot fix it playing around. And you can do bootstrapping with SPSA. You can do resampling with SPSA. Uh, if if um, if you take care in in your optimizer, uh, you can again get better results. Let did it run. Apologize for that. It is it is running with SPSA now. Again, 
this is noise results with noise on the uh, IBM Q Mel Melbourne. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the potential energy surface looks much better now. The fit to the um, experimental values looks much better. And we are almost on top here with SPSA. Finally, with, with all the bells and whistles of Grabber, one, one last very quick run, again, with the same noise. Um, let me start in the now. You would see the, the, the final results that we get, which is the circuit here. Sorry, the energy levels computed here. The potential energy surface, perfect fit with the experimental values, both in the constant pressure and constant volume heat capacity. So that is it for 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 the for the um, Jupyter notebook. Uh, part of this code may uh, find itself in Qiskit at some point uh, through this collaboration. Um, for now, it's only on on our local machines, though. All right. <laughs> No, th thank you so much for sharing that with us and anybody that wants to learn more about uh, those methods that uh, they used, uh, you can find more about it in Qiskit and you can go and you know, play with it uh, in the IQX. And so I you know, would like to thank our guest, Lauren, Dimitar, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for talking to us. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay. And now we go from industry to academia. And it's my great pleasure to now welcome Natalie Klo. And Natalie is a researcher um, in the physics department at the University of Washington, where she works with the Institute um, for Nuclear Theory. She's investigating how to use circuits to simulate field theories on quantum computers, a topic that is very dear to my heart. So she's also a lover of music like Dimitar before, and she loves percussion and marimba. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Natalie. Thank you so much for being here and educating us about you know, the role of quantum circuits in your research. Um, and can you tell us, can you start telling us a little bit about what you do, what led you to study field theory, and why quantum computing? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it's exciting to be here. Uh, I very much enjoyed interacting with IBM throughout my research. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Um, so as Zara said, I'm from the Institute for Nuclear Theory. And what we tend to think about at the Institute for Nuclear Theory is first how uh, nucleons are formed. So how the proton or neutron is formed from the more fundamental constituents like quarks and gluons. And then also how you take these, uh, these nucleons and have them interact uh, with each other to either build larger nuclei or to create uh, neutron stars um, all the way up. So the, the kind of one-liner or the my life in a nutshell right now is, uh, is I'm, I'm researching how to simulate physical systems of these fundamental particles, um, particles and fields by leveraging a quantum computer. Uh, so this is, I'm going to echo something Laurent said that this is not replacing the classical computers, but, but we're looking at how, how you leverage the quantum uh, device. So let me kind of break that down and see what that, that means. Uh, so you can first ask, why, why not just do this classically? And the answer is, of course, we do. Um, and when we do simulate these systems classically, the size of the computers you need uh, tends to grow exponentially with the number of particles that you want to simulate. So if you want to simulate um, or calculate properties of, of small, small molecules uh, or nuclei or a handful of interacting nuclei, uh, the computing resources become quite large and cumbersome, um, requiring usually substantial amounts of time, months, years on high performance computing environments. Um, and the reason that it scales uh, so unfavorably is really rooted at the heart of quantum mechanics, that we're really working with these quantum mechanical systems. Um, and it turns out that every formulation we have created of quantum mechanics uh, requires exponential classical resources to, to represent it. So unless we uh, find some, some very bold uh, ways to reformulate quantum mechanics, 
uh, we seem to be stuck with these exponentially growing computational challenges. Uh, so the realization that I came to or was introduced to by the literature a few years ago uh, was that we actually know systems that scale compatibly. We already know them and they're called uh, quantum nature itself, scales compatibly with the, the quantum systems we're trying to simulate. Um, so if you can build a quantum device out of small pieces of that quantum nature, the size of the computer you need uh, would actually scale naturally with the size or the number of particles that you're attempting to simulate rather than exponentially. Uh, so you might say that's, that's cheating because uh, calculating properties of nature with nature is called experiment. Um, and that's true, but the, the whole field kind of gets its computational flavor when, uh, when you add in something called mutual intersimulatability. Um, it's this ability to map the properties of one quantum system onto another quantum system. For example, um, the ability to, to calculate properties of quarks and gluons inside of a proton, um, not by manipulating quarks and gluons, but by manipulating, say, superconducting circuits or, or trapped ions um, that have been, quote, programmed to act like or emulate the quark and gluon interactions. Um, and this is, this is what gets me excited because we don't ever expect to be able to manipulate quarks and gluons, uh, but we do expect to be able to manipulate uh, superconducting circuits. So. Yeah, and so like, you know, you're talking about that ability to map, you know, the properties of one system onto another and how to do that and how to evolve it to investigate those behaviors that you're interested in learning. That can be really non-trivial. And, you know, there's, here's where circuits, um, quantum circuits play a role. So how do you view circuits? What do they mean to you as a researcher? And can you give us an example of how you embed the physical properties of fields, of field theories into circuits? How do you, you know, make quantum circuits mimic the behavior of that field theory that you want to study? Um, or you know, what do you do to make those circuits more efficient for the problem that you're investigating or for the hardware where you need to send those circuits? Yeah, okay, so that's a lot of questions in one question. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's, start, let's start by saying that the way I see circuits um, and the way that I kind of interact with circuits um, is to think that, that circuits are really like a language. They're a language for me to, to express the interactions that I expect um, to occur, and it's a language that, uh, that the hardware or the qubits will understand. Um, and to the extent that, that the language we use tends to shape the way we think, also the circuit designs that we create tends to shape the way that we quantumly simulate. Um, so these individual pieces of a circuit, um, these quantum gates, each have their, obviously their own unique meaning. They're making, putting transformations onto the quantum state in some predefined way. Um, and just like any robust language, um, the, there are many ways of saying the same thing. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I think of those as, as physical synonyms or, or circuits that, uh, that evolve the quantum system, maintaining the physics I care about, um, but might be very different in terms of cost or in terms of um, what it takes to actually implement these circuits on hardware. Um, so you can think about embedding physical properties into this language, which is something I, I often do and I think I'll touch a little bit on more later. Um, but we're really looking at for ways to, to create efficient calculation by thinking of these circuits as, as physical, physical objects. Um, so impacting the design of these circuits. Um, yeah, so when we design these circuits, you, you're not just thinking about the, uh, the circuit itself, you're thinking what impacts them uh, starts long before you, you even get to the hardware. And, and what I mean by this is um, you can consider that just about every decision you have to make when you're designing your calculation is going to have some impact on the circuit structure that you end up uh, communicating to the hardware. Um, of course, the real physics that you choose to calculate will be independent of these choices. Uh, but for example, the different ways that you, you decide to represent space or represent your, your different particles and fields within this space are going to make modifications to the, uh, the type of circuit that you end up running. Um, and I think, Zara, you asked for an example, so I will give you an example. Yeah. Um, 
so one one big consideration uh, that I tend to think about in, in quantum hardware and in designing calculations is the locality of these interactions. Um, and that's not just locality in the simulation, but also locality on hardware. So I think Jay a few a few days ago said it's a rebel way of thinking to think that your your circuit is is just signals on wires, um, and that is that is an, an excellent way of thinking about it. But at the end of the day, it is it is the signals on wires, and the, the signals have to go somewhere in a device. And if you have um, and if you ha you have signals going at very distant parts of your of your quantum device, uh, you can you can do that. But it tends to be a little noisier, and so we. Can imagine that in, uh, in large class computations, you think about the communications that occur within your within your computer, um, and now we're going to think about the communications that occur within uh, the quantum device. Um, so a famous example of this, um, and it's a very physical example, which is why I like it, and I think this will probably be you know, in textbooks when these textbooks exist. Um, and this is this is in the NISC era, and it's for simulating electrons, positrons and photons, so an electrodynamics, and it exists in one spatial dimension, so just on a line. You have electrons and positrons, and you have the photon field communicating between them. So this is not quite reality, uh, but this system has been of interest in nuclear and particle physics for, for decades um, because it shares similar features with interacting quarks and gluons in three dimensions, which is our reality. So it's, it's a nice... Uh, nice framework to, to start studying the, the types of circuits that we'll use. And the simulation takes place on a lattice with electrons and positrons on the vertices, and the photons um, interact through the links between the vertices. And the, what has become the standard way of formulating these systems, um, all interactions are local on this lattice. Um, and, this, and there's a local constraint actually on each vertex. Uh, to make sure that the electric field or the photons um, are accurately sourced by the electrons and positrons on the vertices. Okay, so that's in a nutshell the, the one, one dimensional electrodynamics. Um, so, so now it turns out when you start thinking about how you would map that onto a quantum device, um, it turns out that this system that with, the non or with the local constraint at every point on the lattice, um, that constraint almost solves the problem um, in terms of the, the local links. And you can define the theory, quote, just as well, or physically synonymously, um, with only one link instead of a link everywhere. Um, and, this, and this is great because it requires fewer qubits. You don't have to map all of those individual links onto qubit degrees of freedom. You just have, have one of these links. And this is actually what was done in the first quantum simulation of this system. Uh, you actually just remove all of those links through a re transformation of the quantum field theory. So this is a great idea from the from the perspective of conserving number of qubits, uh, but it comes with a catch, and the catch is that now your interactions are no longer local on this lattice, but they they are non-local. You have these interactions that are occurring at distant parts of your lattice, um, and for the, the first simulation that I mentioned, this was on trapped ions, where for these small systems, this was a property that, that could be handled experimentally. Um, but if you want to simulate the theory, say, on superconducting qubits, which is something that, that we wanted to do in our research uh, a little while ago, you, uh, you need local interactions. Right? Of course, you can, you can have uh, non-local interactions, but you have, to, you have to step your way all the way through the, through the circuit. And so as any good game of, of telephone, um, you know, it, your interactions change, and there, there's some loss of fidelity. So if you can, can redesign the, the theory to be represented locally, um, then in terms of the hardware, you're, you're looking at some advantages for the representation. And it turns out that physics gives us just that, that natural, uh, natural way of localizing these interactions with the, the gauge field or the, reinserting this, this, this local constraint. Um, so that's a, a kind of physical example that hopefully clarifies what I mean by making a modification to your theory and having dramatic impact on the type of circuit. You end so up continuing on that um, subject of locality and you know, making these modifications of 
the circuits based on the physics. Right? In your work, you have used correlations. You have used certain properties, like the fact that you know, there's a correlation length that is set by the gap of the excitations. You use that to design quantum circuits for preparing the ground states of lattice scalar field theories. So can you give a quick idea of how you design those circuits and what is the role of entanglement there, if any? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was that was a fun fun work. Uh, so it, <laughs> that was 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 inspired by this observation um, that it just so happens in theoretical formulations of quantum fields, this this locality of correlations is is kind of already built in. Um, that in a theory of massive particles, the correlation between two spatial regions of the field um, decay exponentially as they're further separated. Um, so if I were to ask about the expectation value of the product of the field at one, one point in space and the, the field value at another point in space, as I separate them uh, infinitely far, that, that expectation value of the product just becomes the product of the expectation values and they're, they're uncorrelated. Um, so as, as, I, as I spread them apart, the correlations are actually exponentially suppressed. Um, and so this, this observation uh, was, was very alluring to us and it was begging the question, uh, if I want to prepare the low energy state, so a state that is going to have these exponential, exponentially suppressed correlations, um, or like the vacuum state of the quantum field theory, can I make the circuits exponentially localized? So when I, when I represent it onto qubits, can I, can I make it so that any, any qubit at various distances on the chip, uh, the interactions that I need are going to be exponentially suppressed. Um, so can I design a circuit to manifest the localization uh, already present in the physical field being simulated? And of course, uh, the answer is yes, or else I wouldn't be so excited. But uh, <laughs> so if, if I can map the spatial structure of the field that, that I'm simulating onto the spatial distribution of qubits in the chip, then it should be possible to exponentially localize the qubit interactions uh, with respect to physical distance in hardware. Um, and so you can easily stumble upon naive circuit synonyms in this case that are representing the right physics, but um, just in a different way. So these, you can have naive ones for which this is not the case. Um, and we played around with a few of those where, where long distance quantum gates are, are actually dominant. Um, but if you think about it, there, there are transformations that exist, and we, we found a few in our, uh, we found one in our paper, um, where you can restructure the, the quantum gates, uh, the local ones, to be dominant. And actually see that, that as you have gate, quantum gates that are at longer distances in your quantum device, uh, they are exponentially suppressed in their relevance to preparing the state. So it's the, it's the same physics. Just now with this uh, transformed quantum circuit, uh, the computation can be localized to a region on the computer. And, it's, and this localization is robust because it's coming from the, the physical system that we're simulating. So there were there are kind of three takeaways that, that we have for this. Um, two are kind of technical in, in their excitement and one is a little more philosophical. So the, the technical ones is, um, this was exciting to us because it's an alternate approach to state preparation of vacuum states or low energy states that have uh, suppressed entanglement and correlations. Um, and just when you're working with hardware as pretty much um, most people who work with hardware know, it's always good to know multiple ways of solving your problem. Um, the second kind of technical reason this is exciting um, is for a translationally invariant system. So if I have a very large scalar field in this case, or just massive um, field theory, then having these localized um, operators, as you look into the center of your volume, these localized operators are going to be the same everywhere. And so this is finally a way that we can imagine uh, utilizing classical calculations to inform those localized operators, which are then used to initialize a much larger wave function uh, on the quantum computer than you could uh, think about or possibly represent classically. So this is finally getting us on our, on our path to doing much larger systems uh, controllably than we could do classically. Uh, and the philosophical excitement here is 
is just that, that this is a first kind of concrete example of a more general message that the ability to manifest desirable properties of a system uh, that you're simulating should be able to be manifested in the structure of quantum circuits. And so learning how to, to do that transformation and get those properties um, apparent in the quantum circuit, I think is, uh, is an exciting application. Yeah. And that is a excellent pod to finish uh, this session. Sadly, we are already at an hour. Um, you know, this was fascinating. Natalie, thanks so much um, for, you know, for your time, for talking to us. And to everybody that joined us in the stream today, thank you for taking the time to be here, for watching, participating in the chat. The videos for this series are recorded, will stay in the channel. And we hope to see you here next Wednesday at noon. We'll be talking about transpiling circuits. Um, if we enjoy this series or any of the other series in the channel, please subscribe to learn more. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you. Thanks to Laurent, Dimitar. Thank you so much, Natalie. And see Thank you guys you. next week. <laughs>